Hey, everybody, it's me, Chris Ryan, the co-host of The Watch, and I wanted to tell you about one of my favorite shows on the Ringer Podcast Network. It's Ringer FC. So Ringer FC is actually a couple of shows rolled up into one. It's Stadio, which airs on Mondays and Thursdays and features Ryan Hunt and Musso Kwanga talking about the biggest leagues in Europe and around the world and all the football action from the weekend and the weekend to come. And then it also features Wrighty's House, which is hosted by Arsenal legend and British soccer pundit Ian Wright, and they have a rotating cast of guests, including Ryan and Musa, that show up on Wrighty's House. That's an amazing show with a historical perspective from Ian's playing days, but also a lot of stuff about uh, the world around football, which I think is really powerful. You can find Ringer FC every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's Stadio and Wrighty's House on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, he just received his slip-on vans from the Walmart Squid Game merch store. It's Andy Greenwald! You're the guy that's always like, no free ads. That's you true. Police that line <laughs> ferociously and then you begin the show with just a litany. Of course. Well, I, know, I know that you're a guy who's never heard of Vans before Squid Game. You know, he never thought no, of wearing slip-ons. Like, what, what are these shoes? They look like they could be good for fashion or skateboarding. Andy, it's Monday. I thought we could do a little bit of news at the top. There's not a ton, but we could do some. Uh, we're going to finish up our conversation on Squid Game. Uh, we're going to talk about the last couple of episodes, but I want to have a larger conversation with you about what constitutes a hit on what oh. we call television these days. Um, That's exciting. And uh, yeah, I thought we could get into it. Uh, how was your weekend? How, how are you doing today? Well, my weekend was a little lonely because I don't want to blow up your spot, but my my guy Chris was out of town. I was, and. Yeah. It's weird. It was a usually weird... you and I hit the bars on a Saturday night. Well, that's you know? the thing. We don't, <laughs> and especially post COVID, you know, IRL hangouts are, um, are they're special. They're they're not that common. Yeah. But it's interesting the way certain social conventions persist because I think it's not a secret to tell people that we are uh, constantly in communication. Yeah. Um, generally, I send you really inordinate number of texts throughout the day, often with links when you are working or doing other podcasts. <laughs> but for whatever reason, I knew you were away. Um, you and your wife were going on a lovely trip, seeing friends. And I was like, oh. You try I, to stay out it. of my airspace. Yeah. Yeah. Let him, let him have some time. Let him, let him pilot the canoe. But the, the thoughts and the texts, they, they, they bottled up, <laughs> you know? I was rudderless, unlike yeah. you in that canoe. So you didn't oh, no, have like no a plan B who to, who to go to with your texts? No, no, I don't have a Sean Fennessy in my life like okay. you do. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I shots, uh, shots to Sean. I love Sean. No, Sean. I'm sorry. I, 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 he can take it, but after the Jets in Sean London, I don't know if he deserves it. has a big role it. in all of our success here he at does. The Watch. Um, I wanted to tell you that speaking of canoes, I did spend some time on water this weekend. I was up in Oregon yeah. and uh, found out a little bit about myself. Whenever you test yourself against nature, I think it's important <laughs> oh, to Jesus. Okay. come away with lessons. As right. you guys know, The Watch is your home for outdoor activity content you know we, who can forget producer kai mcmullen versus a bear mm -hmm. one of the great anecdotes of the last few years i found out this about myself this weekend i okay. don't know how to row um oh. which you think is like a kind of a bicycle-esque 
row once. You know, yeah. teach a man to row, he'll, <laughs> he'll row across the lake kind of thing. Like, what, you, know, you right. get what I'm saying. I, uh, I thought I knew, I think I've been on a rowing machine before. I thought I had rowed a boat before, but maybe it was just like in like a, a daydream or something. And my wife and I got in a, a rowboat uh, on a, a lake called Clear Lake, which was quite clear in Oregon, and we just immediately started going around in circles. Um, really wow. could not get anything going with the the rowboat, so uh, had to dock that bad boy once I was able to at least master moving forward five or six feet. He, he made it back to the dock. Okay, did uh, we did? It was there was touch and go for a second, and then I uh, got in a kayak, uh, which was much much more than my speed. I, um, that's fascinating. And I appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty <laughs> with our listeners. I wonder if your, um, your irrational confidence about rowing has something to do with the fact that as a Philadelphian, as a Pennsylvanian, you, like I spent a lot of time looking at the image of George Washington crossing the river. Oh, I thought you were going to say, cause you and me are big time regatta boys. Oh, right. Well, there also is the boathouse row and like, just, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, we're big. No, not big rowers. I just feel like we always saw that image of Washington, you know, like like fleeing. And I was like, it doesn't look that hard. It's cold. Yeah, he's These not rowing, little... though. He's just standing at the front of the boat, like over there. Well, let me, can we get Phoebe on the line? Was that <laughs> your strategy also? She did some standing when she was like, do I have to jump out of this thing or can you right. get us back to the dock? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I don't know where to go with this because I desperately wish I could just continue to talk about being regatta boys, but that's never been our lifestyle, <laughs> it's unfortunately. Not. It's not. Uh, can, can, I, can I give you um, some viewing highlights from the weekend? Oh my God, did you watch some, some stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I got a, I, I mean, there's one that isn't going to surprise anyone. Um, if you are one of our loyal listeners who also has a Criterion uh, collection, subscription, Criterion channel, um, this filmmaker has become one of my favorite filmmakers, a, a Finnish guy named Aki Korismaki. There are three more of his movies up right now. Did he um, just under crank out three more? Or did he? No, f- no. They, they, find, they found just, some other ones. They found some other ones uh, <laughs> yeah. in a rowboat that was left unattended, circling somewhere uh, near a fjord. Um, it's it's the it's called the Finland trilogy for I think because he made three movies back in Finland after making movies in France for a number of years and. I just adore his films. If you are a fan in any way of Jim Jarmusch or Wes Anderson, you will find something to love here. Um, Three movies on Criterion to check out. But I have to say something. I don't know where you're going to go with this. I don't know what this is going to awaken in you. Maybe it's going to, maybe it's poking the bear. Maybe you're anti or maybe you didn't even engage. But I know, I know people love when I'm like six months late to something. And I have to weigh in and say that my household watched In the Heights this weekend. Oh, okay. Which, yeah, I, was, I, was, I thought you might be like a caught up on Narcos. <laughs> no, ah, were you excited? Yeah, it's like I was like, this is amazing. What's this? this is gonna be like another Ozark moment? <laughs> no, no, I was like, what I tried to, I tried to temper your expectations when I, I you that's know, fine. I, I didn't yes. think you had an opinion, but I, I look, I missed, or maybe please miss me with whatever discourse uh, marred the release, the one year COVID delayed release of the adaptation of Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical In the Heights. And then it was on HBO Max and then it wasn't. Dude, I love this. It was outstanding. I don't understand. I, 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 all the only things, and maybe this is a question of media diet or whatever, or also how difficult it was for some people to get to the theater, especially when this was released. But I thought this was a brilliantly made musical film. And I don't understand why... America didn't get behind this movie. Uh, let me ask you something. Is yes. the In the Heights soundtrack on in the in the whip? Do you guys, do, does the fam sing along to In the Heights? Was this something that had been bedded oh. into your daughter's lives like the way Hamilton was? Um, yes, they are not as into it as they are into Hamilton, but they love it and they okay. had become familiar with it, yes. And they were Before excited to see it. Before seeing it, they knew the music. They knew a lot of the music, yes. And so, you know, look, this is definitely... This is a co-production, this take, from where I'm sitting in my office and my um, weekend cabana on Daddington Island. <laughs> uh, boy, that really makes it sound like I only parent on the weekends. Not true. But um, I just thought that it was really brilliantly directed. I thought John Chu did a really great job in capturing, because I feel like, look, we'll get into Squid Game in a second. I don't want to, I don't want to pause too much. But every few years... You know, a major director, and I'm thinking specifically most recently of um, of La La Land when that came out, right? It was like, oh, um, you know, it's, it's a tribute to the the great movie musicals that formed Damien Chazelle, you know? And, and then you watch La La Land and I'm like, I, I guess they danced on the road and they like jazz, but I didn't really feel like 
uplifted. It didn't do the same things for me that like Singing in the Rain did. Mm -hmm. This movie took advantage of two things that felt fresh. You know, it had a vibrancy and there were some CGI elements with people dancing on the side of buildings that were just, I thought, beautifully integrated. But also it was a movie about a part of America and about a part of our city that you never get to see shine like this. And I thought it was beautifully done. I was really impressed. Yeah, it's so star interesting. Star making, hear, Anthony hear Ramos, you talk star about making. It. I, I, you know, I, I one of the things that's sort of been uh, a hallmark around, I would say the kind of conversations that we tend to have, the kind of conversations that we at the Ringer tend to have, is you know the, whether or not something is immediately, mm-hmm. uh, either critically, commercially, or artistically successful. You know, mm-hmm. and and especially in light of the way COVID's changed how we wind up seeing movies, I think that. And this is actually it does lead into how I wanted to talk about Squid Game because it's like yeah. uh, we are being told left and right, and and I think you can sort of, to the extent that you are out on the street, you can feel a palpable like swell of like people talking about this. Like I, I talked to my mom for the first time in a week today. She was just like, "I'm watching Squid Game." It's like my mom barely knows how to work a television. God bless her heart. She, but she has figured out how to watch like this show, and it was somehow. My mother, who mm-hmm. just watches West Wing over and over and over again, is like, I'm watching, I'm watching Squid Game. It, it, it has cracked certain ceilings that you would just not expect a show to crack. But like one of the things that's sort of been interesting is all the stuff that's come out over these last 18 months, and I don't know that there's necessarily been, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of what's been the quote-unquote biggest hit, I guess. Shang-Chi was, was a pretty big hit. Like There have been success stories. But whether there will be stuff we go back to yeah. And have like a more like sober appreciation of outside of did it make day and date work for HBO Max or was it worth the wait after it's being shelved for a year and a half due to COVID halts and stuff. And I think that that's going to be kind of a no time to die conversation. It did not do yes. especially well this weekend um, in at least domestically. I think it did quite well uh, in England where it, it obviously would. And but, internationally everywhere. You know, I found myself when I watched, I saw No Time to Die a couple weeks ago and I talked about it on the big picture with Sean and Amanda and I was just kind of like, I, I feel almost like relief that it's over. I think that was my, my sort of take. Like, it seems like Daniel Craig wanted it to be over. It seems like they need to reset this character and reset this series and get out from under a lot of like, you know, what is Spectre's relationship to Bond kind of conversations. But I wonder whether or not in six months it might seem like a much more palatable movie to me or a much more, like a less way down movie and i wonder if that's maybe the the reaction you're happy yeah. with, having within the heights where you're like outside of whether or not they can make this work or it's whether it does well i kind of just liked the singing and dancing and the effects and the and the story yeah i mean i think i i think covid broke so many things in this country including expectations as a filmed piece of entertainment as a movie musical i thought in the heights was exceptional and i absolutely understand why people at Warner Brothers were like, this is going to win us Oscars. It should. I I don't understand what the Oscars are for, if not to celebrate something as big hearted and exuberant and technically proficient as a movie like this. It just ought to be, it ought to have been more successful. And I think that the year long delay and then the HBO Max thing, and then, you know, Delta and everything else that went on, uh, absolutely affected it. But it doesn't take anything away from its excellence. And I think it has fans and it will mm-hmm. continue to have fans and it's going to do very well for a very long time to come. I'm not necessarily worried about that in any way. I just think it's a shame that more people didn't didn't check it out. But to the other point, um, yeah, I mean, we've been headed this way for a long time. The idea of like what's successful if it doesn't open to $50 million is a whole thing. But we, we that that's predates... Twitter or any, you know, any uh, avenue we use to discuss these, these points or any sort of shorthand we use. But I think that um, post-COVID and then post, you know, do movie theaters even exist anymore? We are entering this very, very strange place where, look, I think the big picture story is no one knows anything. No one knows what to make of anything. And then the waters are further muddied by behavior like Warner Brothers, which I, Warner Media, which I don't blame. But, you know, last week we were talking about Many Saints of Newark, and Many Saints of Newark did not do particularly well at the box office by any stretch, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. But Warner Brothers got way out in front of it, and they were like, this movie was a huge, huge, huge ground-shifting success for our streaming strategy. It's like, okay, great. 
because Good. it lifted all boats, right? Because it was it was something that made people rewatch a lot of The Sopranos and spend a lot of time on the platform, right? Well, they're also saying people watched it on the platform. Maybe sure. they saw a drive in subscriptions. We we don't actually know. We also can't fact check them. We I came up with like, three or cool. four different identities just to subscribe to HBO Max because I was so excited <laughs> that to see seems, young Polly Walnuts. Yeah, that seems like a waste of money, but I, I support <laughs> you. But. Beyond that, you know, that's this is my it, new instead of uh, donating to various Democratic congressmen over the years, <laughs> I'm just going to start <laughs> coming up with aliases to get new subscriptions. But are all your aliases like Beto Boy 2020? You know, yeah, all Beto the emails blocker. I started to, uh, to, yeah, to, to to fight the resistance. But I, I, I am not, and, and this is actually a conversation that I would like to to have w- with Sean and with Amanda and with people who are paying more attention to the movies than than I generally am, but. It does seem, it does seem, it never seemed particularly wise to build an entire medium's financial strategy on the success of comic book movies, which is where we were. But now everyone seems to be sort of accepting the fact that if it's not making Avengers money, it's mm-hmm. somehow a failure. And that's what's happening with Bond this weekend when everyone was like, well, Bond was the first movie that had to fall off the schedule and they saved it, they treasured it, they cradled it like a valuable jewel until finally it could get back in theaters where it belonged. And then it, you know, another huge rollout and it comes out and it does well. It did well. It, it didn't did well. do Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage well, yeah. but it did well. But in what world is a two hour and 40 minute swan song for a 53 year old British spy going to make as much money as Venom 2 Let There Be Carnage. That's just a, it, it's not even like they're competing with each other anymore. A comic book movie at this point feels like its own plank on the what should we do this weekend wheel. Like, should we go to dinner or should we go see a comic book movie or should right. we go see a movie? Almost like three distinct options. And I'm not sure what it, there already wasn't a middle class or a middle ground in, in, in terms of how we view cinematic success. So where are we headed now? I don't know. I mean, the thing I wanted to talk to you most about Squid Game is is word of mouth. And I think some word of mouth right. might have helped Bond. You know, I think that obviously Bond is always going to be a, a, a pretty consistently successful enterprise, especially during the Daniel Craig era, which I f- feel like really, really reached these incredible heights, both in terms of box office, but in terms of its acclaim and the Mendes movies, uh, in, you know, I think Casino Royale first, but then the, the two Mendes films, even though I thought Spectre sucked really, like, it, they, they at least had like a lot of juice to them but uh, Skyfall was Skyfall because Skyfall was great um, because you could go home and if you were a Bond uh, pa- a passionate Bond fan and or if you happened to go see Skyfall in a preview or you went and saw the first weekend you probably told five to ten people how great Skyfall was yeah if, if those people weren't already planning on seeing it because they read all of the positive press about how incredible Javier Bardem is what an amazing story is what an amazing performance Judy Dench gives what a great job Craig does the Roger Deakins photography like all these things are selling points they sound like we just are rattling off Mm -hmm. names on an athletic team roster or something but like those were all reasons to go see Skyfall and to love it and Mm -hmm. uh, for all the people who were very talented who were involved in No Time to Die I I have nothing really to recommend about it you know I mean I think it's it's an okay movie it's got some pretty cool set pieces I think that they wasted Rami Malek or Rami Malek wasn't right for the part one or the other and I think that there's like, it's it's hard to come out of it and be like, yeah, you should take whatever risk you feel like there is in going inside of a movie theater for almost three hours or probably three hours once trailers are over and to go see this movie because like I, I it's it's like okay it is actually like aside from its you know gigantic s- scale it's kind of the perfect movie to watch at home and kind of the perfect movie to zone mm-hmm. out of a couple of times and. The, the thing that I'm really taking from Squid Game is just even, you know, maybe narcissistically taking myself as an example of somebody who heard about it, kind of was like, I don't know what that is. Uh, enough people have told me that I should watch it that I've watched a couple episodes. And now I've immediately texted half of my contacts list being like, yep. hey, did you watch Squid Game yet? I really want to talk about Squid Game. Did you, did you see this? This is fucking incredible. To the next week, some of the same people I texted putting up memes of squid game about like the Dallas Cowboys or something in the case of Jason Gallagher. And like, it's just sort of like, it's a kind of incredible process that it, maybe it's just like, we, we try to reinvent the wheel so many times. It's like the wheels right there, man, make good stuff. And people will start talking about it. Yeah. I think there's one missing piece there, which I, and I agree with everything you said. And I've 
played the same role for a lot of the other contacts that I didn't text this weekend when you were away, right. but thought about. Um, and you were like, in the heights, have you heard of it? It went over great. <laughs> I almost texted, I sat on that text, get ready. for. I was going to send it to you. All the Anthony Ramos memes, the Jimmy Smith singing memes. Um, the thing about recommending Squid Game is that it's super fun to recommend Squid Game. Because watching Squid Game, being a part of the Squid Game discourse, becoming a fan of it, looking forward to the next episodes is thrilling. It's great. It's on some level, it's what we got into this business for, to see something, get excited about it and share it, talk about it. And that absolutely is the secret sauce. And you, you can't program for it mm-hmm. and you can't crack the code of it. And it, it was interesting to be reading, um, and we, we cite his column a lot, and it's a newsletter. People should check it out. Um, Joe Adalian over at Vulture's column called Buffering, where he talks about the streaming yeah. wars. He had a column uh, up today, and maybe it was before the weekend, but I read it uh, earlier this morning, that's basically revisiting the argument of whether you should, whether these streamers should be doing the binge model or the week-to-week model. And the examples he uses are two very different success stories, one being Squid Game, which, as everyone knows, was dumped its Netflix, so it was all available from the day it was released, versus Only Murders in the Building, um, which has been going week to, uh, three episodes I think to begin, two or three episodes to begin, and then week to week on Hulu. And per Joe's column, Only Murders has grown more and more popular as the Mm -hmm. weeks have gone by, and he credits it to a savvy combination of viral marketing and word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera, and the episodes may be getting better, although I would strongly disagree that they've been getting better, but that's my critical take on it, and we're still talking about the phenomenon. Um, And at the end of it, you know, he's sort of doing what we're all doing, which is, well, some models work for some shows and some models work for other shows, and it's up to these services to figure out which is which. But the secret sauce in both is that they're both pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. And I know this is like the most basic argument ever, but you cannot, uh, for a podcast, because we're not even arguing, but you cannot game quality. Yeah. You you, kind of can't. You can't predict that something is going to go like wildfire necessarily, but you also can't fake it. You can't hide it. You can't obscure it. Um, So speaking of newsletters, uh, Fantasy hit me up about this and I I checked it out. It was really, it was Richard Rushfield's Ankler column that Mm -hmm. he does as a a newsletter. And he had a a tidbit in his most recent column about foundation. And it was essentially like, by whatever metrics you want to say, like, let's just say that each episode of foundation is about the cost of like a mid budget sci-fi movie, because that's what it certainly looks like. Um, what would it have? How many like subscribers would Apple have to be garnering off of Foundation alone to make it quote unquote worth it? And he basically makes a uh, more of a rhetorical argument than a like a uh, like a researched argument, but it's one that I I tend to buy, which is like, in what world is Foundation kind of not a flop? You know, right? Like, given Great question. given the amount of money that was spent on it, if and he goes on to say, like, I think that this might cost, like, you know, he was, I think he was talking about the Roald Dahl books that are going to be adapted by Netflix, and where they bought for an insane amount of money. And he was like, when John Carter from Mars came out, and it cost two hundred fifty million dollars to make, and it was only made two hundred eighty four million dollars at the box office, people were like, this is a career killing, like all time like face plant. Yeah. And they were right. I mean, Taylor Kitsch arguably has never really recovered from being in that movie. You know what I mean? Like there just today, I read a story about how Alan Horn, the chairman of Walt Disney pictures is stepping down after an incredibly successful nine year tenure. And before that, like a 50 year career in Hollywood, he ran yeah. Castle Rock and Warner brothers, et cetera, et cetera. But in this story that ran today, Monday, he's credited for saving Disney after the disastrous reign of his predecessor, Rich Ross parentheses, John Carter from Mars. <laughs> Today. That's what they're going to be saying about like the guy who replaces Urban Meyer. You know what I mean? Like in 20 years, <laughs> right. we're just going to be like, it's like the disastrous re- <laughs> previous regime, parentheses, Urban Meyer. The point being is that like we have no metric for failure any more than we do for success. I You say this thing about only murders in the building and I, I, I enjoy that show and it seems like more and more people started watching it over the course of its existence and I can certainly imagine people like my mom enjoying it if they get their hands on it. But I have no real way of, of, of evaluating how successful that show is or isn't any more than I have any real way of evaluating whether Foundation is or isn't successful. But we're kind of just like sort of reading the tea leaves whereas... 
to go back to our original sort of conversation topic about in the heights and, and no time to die box office still sort of determines whether or not right. we are like that was a worthwhile endeavor or not you know and you could say in the heights was completely successful and it's it, you know along with hbo max pushing it it probably has been seen by maybe even more people who would have had then who would have had to a chance to see it if it was just a theatrical release and bond you know, is probably successful by whatever metric they're using to judge it. But we're kind of like, ah, yeah, lukewarm. Not so sure that really popped off. But we're just like taking people's word for it that Squid Game, I guess I Squid Game's an outlier. It's obviously a blockbuster, but I don't know. It's hard to tell what what, what hits. I, well, I also think that um, the other thing that complicates matters is just the spending power of the company's spending um, these right. days. Apple can afford to make foundation a rounding error. Not only can they afford to make it a rounding error, they just greenlit a season two because, look, I'm sure, I I think it's best to assume good faith um, reasons for almost everything. And I assume that they believe strongly in the creative vision of David Goyer and his collaborators and they like what they've heard for the season two pitch and they like where it's going and they like working with people and I'm sure it's all good reasons. But if it wasn't and they didn't want to have their entire TV enterprise tagged with a, oh my God, these guys just spent six John Carters for no visible return. Yeah. They could just renew it and spend more. They can actually put good money after bad money yeah. to make yeah. it seem like it was a success, tell everyone it was and move on. It doesn't matter. So, yeah. so that does affect how we think about things. And and actually, my segue, and this, you, you're the segue guy, but my segue to suggestion for talking about Squid Game is it's somehow more pure to talk about it because it is absolutely a success and it's absolutely good. And had we discovered it through, God knows, just some late night accidental autoplay on Netflix and it wasn't a global phenomenon, we would be so thrilled to share it with people. Mm -hmm. This show is now on its pace, I think, to become the biggest show in Netflix history. I mean, they already talked about how it was catching up with, if not surpassing, or rivaling Bridgerton and The Witcher. I did not know The Witcher was that popular, but according to Netflix's somewhat, you know, um, fingerprinty uh, analytics, that the, it, the, those are those two biggest shows in, the, in the, the services history. I think you would also put it up there with shows like, um, obviously, it, it, it's, in, it's part of Netflix's international distribution story with Lupin and Money Heist and Narcos, but... Um, I think it, you know, now it needs to be considered on sort of the Rushmore of least commercially successful Netflix shows. Yeah. Um, I have no doubt whatsoever that there will be a second season. Uh, it seems like that, that, that is probably the easiest bet to ever make. Although I guess that hasn't been officially released. I was curious whether or not you felt like the way, the ways in which we are certain that mm-hmm. this is a hugely successful show changes your mind about maybe some of the other shows that we've been, we've considered successful over the last 18 months like oh yeah that's what a big show looks like well what what are you comparing it to what are the I don't even know I don't even know I mean like honestly like I'm so excited for succession to come back and like I think I, I I can't wait to talk about it with you for the next two and a half months like we're doing all these pods about it like it's it's gonna be exciting I don't know I mean like I, what, what what is how many people watch succession on a given episode like seven million six million like no, much, no. much, much, much less. I mean, right. but again, that's all getting muddied. I think that like, I don't have in front of me. My guess would be that when season two was airing, the original Sunday night at the moment it aired audience in HBO was probably a million people per episode. Okay. And then they would probably say it went up to two or three maybe during the course of the week over re-airs. It's returning to a very different landscape in one in which I believe, and we'll know soon enough, I believe it has become much more popular. Not only did it win the Emmy since it last aired, but many people, this is anecdotally, seem to have caught up or become into it, and the the wave of anticipation seems to have only helped it. But I think you are right to point to succession because I think that the ceiling for its popularity, it would actually probably break our minds and also break this podcast if we actually looked at the numbers for the shows that we worship, whether they are mayor or succession, and compared them to not just The Witcher, but compared them to Falcon and Winter Soldier, a show that Mm -hmm. we watched and we podcasted about. But if you actually saw how many people around the world watched that versus I May Destroy You, then we may be destroyed. 
Yeah, I guess I I don't really have a, a, a another show in mind. I, I fully acknowledge that there are certain critical darlings. There are shows that are difficult to find. There are shows that, you know, we talked about the Bureau, which isn't even on and is on AMC Plus. And like, you know, it's like, it's not like I think everything we talk about is somehow, uh, you know, in some sort of rarefied commercial error. It's just that when you start seeing the numbers that Netflix has thrown around, like 80 mm-hmm. million households have engaged with Squid Game and... You know, if you write up, if you Google Squid Game popularity, waves and waves of articles about its viral, sensational uh, popularity on social media platforms, but also like Squid Game gonna, is going to be the biggest yeah. Halloween costume. That's Squid the thing. Game uh, and all this uh, stuff that is just kind of like. It's going to be so big in two weeks' time. I mean, you started the show by referencing it. That actually is going to be a real yeah. world indicator. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. But yeah, I was curious whether you thought about whether or not it kind of... uh... It, it changed the way we kind of looked at other shows. The other thing I was just curious about was whether or not you felt like the second half of the season lived up to the first half because we hadn't really talked about it. We, yeah, so from this point on, we're going to spoil it. We're going to talk freely about the show. We've danced yeah. around it long enough. Um, yes and no. So I absolutely love the show. I love the experience of watching the show. I miss having more episodes to watch. And I, I kind of had something that I haven't felt in a while, which was a very keen sense of like pre-nostalgia as I was watching the last episodes being like, oh, I'll never not know this again. And, right. and that was kind of a fun feeling to have again after a while or after being jaded for a, <laughs> a minute. Um, I think that the challenges of the back half of the season were always going to be challenges um, because, you know, like with any mass market, even marginally genre show, it will have to go from questions to answers. It will have to go from a big group of red shirts and chum and possibility to getting down to it. Someone's mm-hmm. going to have to win. And I think that with all, considering all that, I think that the show stayed very true to itself. And I think that that's the highest praise you can give a, you know, really ambitious project like this. I think that, um, Dong Hyuk Wong, who made the show, I mean, he he made it all himself, right? He was originally pitching this as a film for him to write and direct over 10 years ago. He basically treated this as a film. He wrote and directed the entire thing and had such a steady hand on the type of show he wanted to tell so that as pieces fell off the board, even if I took issue with some of the way the pieces fell, and we should probably get into some of the specifics about it, um, I, I, I never once doubted that the creator was in control and taking us to a very specific place that we could then reflect back on. When you talk about the second half of the season, though, what you're talking about, I think, or what we have to talk about are three major pieces, Mm -hmm. right? In the back half of the season, and it's not really half, there's, what, nine episodes, so last third, let's say, we get what I think is generally being celebrated by everyone as the best episode, the masterpiece episode, episode six, Gambu. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the uh, Marbles episode. You also get, unfortunately, what I think is recognized correctly as the weakest episode, episode seven VIPs, and then you get the end, one yeah. lucky day. And so we have the, the highest point, the lowest point, and maybe the most contentious point, the end. So it's sort of difficult to wrap your head around what all that means when the first few episodes are such brilliant exposition and such an incredible rush, exhilarating rush of like, what the fuck is happening now? Um, so maybe we should get into those three specific things. I'd like to start with the lowest point, okay, um, which is VIPs. And actually, maybe um, put on my gold-plated lion mask and... Uh, argue against myself, because while it was unquestionably the lowest point, I kind of forgive the show, because do you know how challenging it probably was to find three to five Native American English speakers on a budget in South Korea during COVID? Like, this show was not budgeted to be an international success, so it's not like they could have just called any American actor and flown him in to play these parts. Right. 
You know, this is something we covered recently when we were talking about Le Bureau, which is like, we are certain people speaking foreign languages are fucking genius Brando level performers until the foreign language in question is ours. And we're like, you were serious about that? So speaking so, of Le Bureau, how did you, did, were you like me and you thought that the horniest VIP was Buddy Garrity? <laughs> yes. But not just that. I was like, oh, like this is the Brad Leland corollary where like everyone in the world apparently watched Friday Night Lights and they were like, what is America? And they were like, it's this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in the case of the Bureau, they were like, would you like to fly to France to be this guy for us for two seasons? And he was like, hell yeah. They may have placed a call. But right. again, they filmed the show during COVID, so I bet he couldn't make it. Um, I, I, I've read some defenses of the episode basically saying that the flatness of the delivery and the almost you know, bordering on farcical, s- stereotypical, like just rich grossness was intentional. Like mm-hmm. these characters were not supposed to be multidimensional. They were supposed to be like fat, horny, and sad and mm-hmm. dumb and venal. And like, that's telling us something. And I think that's a very generous reading of what I really do feel was the one place where the show's imagination kind of faltered and it's casting definitely couldn't keep up. I don't think those are like strikes, but that's just the way it is. I thought se- like the seventh episode suffered for coming after the sixth episode. So I, that, that was always going to be tough. You know, th- there's both this, the seventh, and then it's eight is episode eight front man or is episode nine. Yeah, which front? is the shortest episode. Yeah. yeah. And so it's an interesting middle like it's it's an interesting pre uh final act for the season is this you you have this dramatic high and then there's almost this uh valve release with the uh seventh and eighth episodes mm. i you know they deviate from the players for the most part um they obviously they concentrate on um on on like we said like the sort of the watchers the audience for this game and the people who run the game and a little bit of this investigation by a police officer into the game. But I, I, I felt like that they were probably fine. They just happened to come after six. And I do remember, you know, seasons of lost or 24 and stuff like that. And you'd have like a epic episode. And then like the next two would just kind of feel yeah. like, yeah, that was okay. But that wasn't the constant. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And they can't all be the constant. I mean, right. you, first of all, you can't operate on God level all the time, but also right. um, it, you earn the constant by laying groundwork and the first five episodes built to six. And I, it's, for me, it's really more of advantage. It's, it's more of an example of a creator um, to use a, a, a football cliche, letting the game come to him. I'll give you another football he, cliche he, he, where he, he yeah. No, I was just going to say that you're kind of you're talking about like how it wound down and you were like, yeah, I guess this was always going to be about people, you know, and it was going to have to get down to one or two or two, two of them, one p- people. It kind of, you know, that that sick episode six kind of reminded me of NFL wildcard weekend, which is like the most fun is yes. when there's still a lot of teams involved and, yeah, and crazy things have, can like, happen. Yeah. And like, you know, when you get to, um, you know, the the bridge with the glass tiles, I think that's like. That's like the conference championships. You're just like, holy shit. You know, like this is really the best of the best are here. And then, yeah, it's going to not, it's not going to feel as like titillating when it's like these three characters that it, in different ways you've come to care about. I know you have your takes on, on saying woo. It, uh, it, it, it's, it's true, but it's also, I think worth saying, and I do think this is valid, which is, and it's actually baked into the show, which is that being rich isn't interesting. Being this debased and rich is sick there's a sickness to it and there's nothing interesting there's there aren't really different at a certain point you've got the heaviest crystal decanter for your most aged scotch like you can't do better than that right and so the show itself is a commentary on like where where does this go where where else could this possibly go and it goes to a place of watching poor people kill each other for fun right and once you get to that point i mean there's not a version of it where the rich vips are going to be interesting i think that's baked into the nature of the show uh in a way that i appreciate that said i i i did think the glass bridge was was pretty riveting and the thing about the show (laughs) that's nuts is that you keep I, i won't say you i kind of like like a, maybe this is I'll, I'll do as a football analogy maybe like a, a like Andy Reid kept taking my eye off the clock like I, this was the seventh episode right but I thought for sure that um, I, I, I'm I'm referring to my uh, Wikipedia uh, crib sheet here when um, Mino Han 
you know, who's the the, the woman who keeps calling everyone babe, and uh, Jung Duk So, the gangster. Like, mm-hmm. I, I kind of thought we'd have them longer. Then all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh, this is happening now. Like, even in this episode that yeah. I thought was a little bit of an afterthought, this is going to happen. Here it goes. And I think that, that they could have probably maintained this level of tension and interest and maybe been able to get into a couple of different things if this had been like a 15 episode season. Like, I'm not saying I wanted it that way. I'm not saying it had to be that way. I'm not saying it would have been better if it was that way. I'm just saying that, like, if if the bridge episode was two more episodes later and they had done more stuff with the detective or more stuff with the front man and their the brother relationship there, which is kind of not yada yada, but like not really explored in depth. I, I don't think. Well, first of all, you're the Roger Goodell of this analogy because you're always trying to add games to the season when the That's players right. are like, we're good. That's we're right. fine. Our bodies can't take it. I will take the counter position. I didn't want a single extra minute of this season. Um, <laughs> not because I didn't love it, but because certain things like the front man being revealed to be the cop's brother, I don't think we want that in the light much longer. Like, that's a little silly. Just right. like, all, you know, a, a, a disturbing number of the participants in the game knowing each other or running into each other in and outside of the game world. Like, there are certain conventions that you just have to, that are the cost of buying in. And I appreciated the the, the mystery of it and the the idea that, you know, that, Everybody is corrupt or complicit, and there is no simple. I mean, because the cop's storyline uh, is basically like, I'm going to expose this. Like, I have found the devil, right? But mm-hmm. the devil is his brother, who he was looking for all along. And 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 as a thematic point, which is one of the things the show excels at, that that everyone is stuck in a system um, and is trapped in it and is is suffering mightily because of it. I think that that helps there. It sure. doesn't necessarily help in terms of like, well, what, did they get along as brothers? <laughs> what <would> they, <laughs> clearly, he gave him a kidney. Did they play you know any I mean? cool games as children? As children. So yeah. um, th- there was a feeling though, like, th- the thing about Six, Six is so good. But one of the things about Six that I just really loved and, and wanted to really highlight is it's to going back to the creator and and just like letting the game come to him there's there's one thing to like create these circumstances that finds these characters uh stuck playing these games against each other or suddenly realizing they have to compete and that one of them isn't going to make it but there's the other thing about taking full advantage of every potential outcome of that moment mm-hmm. you know so that episode plays us like a Stradivarius violin in the best possible way was this the episode where you texted me song was a real piece of shit afterwards or was that the <laughs> bridge of tiles? Cause then I was like, I, I wanted to let you know that I, my response to Andy, this was six, uh, this six. was, um, I'm zagging here. This guy's my MVP. This guy, this is the horse. This is the Mahomes of this thing. Someone has written, like I've seen multiple people write this take that, 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 that song the- should have won squid game. I mean, he is the Brady. He is Tom Brady yeah. in that he he will do anything. And I'm sorry, did, did someone stutter when they explained the rules? You know what I mean? Like, he's just there to play. Yeah. And he is playing everything to its fullest. He's paying attention to everything. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, do you want to, I mean, the, he, he did Ali dirty, man. He that's, did. That's I did. He did. But this was it this sucked. isn't bro school. This isn't like hanging out. Like we're not trying to like build friendships here. Are we not? I mean, <laughs> like some people there clearly just came to Squid Game to make friends. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it is the reality TV thing writ large. Right. Um, I also wanted to mention just you were talking about um you were talking about the the sixth episode. The thing I think I've identified that I really loved about this episode, and I've seen other people have talked about this too, is the uh the ability of the creators to kind of make it at once a fable Mm -hmm. but also very realistic and of the world so it feels like a story that you could hear around a campfire as a kid or that you could read in a a book of tales or something like that like these games squid game in general like the entire like like even just like the little anecdotes about like these people who are trapped and they're playing like it, what, what summer camp did you go to no, they feel like twilight zone episodes or something <laughs> okay, like that okay, you know what right. i mean but at the same time the context around why these people are playing the game or what conditions create a world in which this game might be an option for people 
feels very real. You know, it feels very of the like current economic social moment, right? Yes. I mean, I, I without question, I, I absolutely loved the show and I love, you know, and people have made, many people have made the comparison to Parasite and it's made me very interested in what other K-dramas I've been missing out on because this seems to be the, the, the South Korean cultural apparatus seems extremely invested in dissecting the hideous tendrils and tentacles of late stage capitalism. And I am here for it. Um, it is absolutely savage and brutal because that's what the world is, you know, and that's what's resonating with people about it. And the fact that like the, the thing about Sang Woo, like, yeah, he's, he's not really the greatest guy, but in terms of choosing the players to represent in the game, the f- chosen son, the favorite son of the poor neighborhood who exceeded beyond anyone's dreams and was the hero being crushed by those expectations, being chewed up and spit out by a financial system that only wants him to make profit. And then when he goes to any length possible to make profit, he's kicked aside. Mm -hmm. And then bringing it all back to the ways that this system encourages people to just disappoint or mistreat or ignore their elders and then pay it forward by ignoring their children. I mean, it's so baked into every frame of it. It's kind of brilliantly done. I don't know if this is the time to pivot to the end or if you want to talk more about six. No, let's pivot to the end. Okay, let's stay at six for one second. In six, six is the last time we have some feel-good moments in Tug of War. I I personally... <laughs> tons of feel-good moments. That's the thing. Personally, had I Wait, participated wh- in Tug of War... which episode is the strobe light brawl at night to, of like uh, no sleep till death? Three or four, I think. Okay, three or four. yeah. I mean, I, I would have a hard time feeling good about tug of war considering my success resulted in just the shattering of the spines of everyone else, right? Um, I also do want to, like, a, in retrospect, look back on. I love on, that you're you're clinging to the ideas of having like a feel good victory in Squid Game. <laughs> well, the old man is just like, yes, I know the secret to winning a tug of war. I do think that the whole idea that he was just playing along and was having fun. Curious how he would have navigated being pulled to his absolute instant death and in tug of war. You know what I yeah. mean? Like that, that, there's a little hole in his thinking there. Do you think that is, but, is the implication that he's protected by the guards at various points during the game? Um, I think, I think the implication is that he would have been. Yeah. Because it's like, I, I felt like he very much th- during the, the, the night fight the in, brawl, the, in the, he just in the went dorm, up, yeah. he's just like, I'm popping an ambo and I'm going over here. Like I'm, I'm not, not getting involved. <laughs> He reminded, his behavior in that reminded me, I, we've talked about this in the podcast, but there was that, like, one time we went to, uh, where did we go? We went to San Diego Comic-Con, and we shared a hotel room, and it was the first time I'd seen, like, young Chris Ryan's sleep routine as an adult. And your sleep routine was just like, I'm just going to put on these headphones, cross my arms over my body like a vampire, <laughs> and I'm good. You can read, but I just press the switch, and I'm done for the night. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that was a similar It's gotten got a little bit more complicated since then, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, but so when we're in episode six, and all our, all our best pals are still there, mm-hmm. did you have any, like, rooting interest? Were there people you wanted to last longer? Were there people you... Was there an end game strategy that you saw that didn't involve Gihun, our main character, winning the game? I thought maybe uh, Saibyuk would uh, would come through. I couldn't tell if they were setting it up for, you know, her having the kind of like the hero's arc there and that Jihoon's like redemption is to give her the life that, you know, that she... I kind of thought that too. Yeah. Um, But again, this is just like the the artistry that is actually just um, on some level like architectural draftsmanship to bring it to that final triangle. Saibyuk can't be in the finale because she can't, she wasn't set up to win, but she also can't be defeated by our hero. And so setting up this, you know, schoolboys thing that was sort of foreshadowed by the very opening of the show, she has to she has to be like the final level for Sangu to cross to become the supervillain. I mean, mm-hmm. it was awful and cruel in a way to a character that was probably by the end my favorite, but that also kind of made sense in the design plan, so I can't really fault it. Um, I, I, I just was so impressed by the way the dramatical stakes 
factored into our enjoyment of the episode because you're watching the Marbles episode, you're watching episode six and the twist when, oh, they're gonna have to compete against each other, which I'm sure many people saw coming, but it was still effective. Um, and then realizing in that moment as the camera, again, so well-directed flashes between the teams and you're like, well, we're only getting 50% of these people are moving forward. And one of the people is Ji Young, who's the young woman who we learned in that episode, you know, uh, killed her father and just got out of prison and all that. The way that that actress, um, Lee Yumi, plays it, you know, mm -hmm. with this just like, this quietly accepting devastation is so powerful. And it just, it, it, it infects you over the course of the episode. You know, there's just this deep blooming sadness that it was most present in that episode. I mean, that was obviously for many people, the emotional high point or low point, depending. I thought it was brilliant. And then we get to the finale, which we have to discuss. So I... Once again, I want to credit um, Dong Kyo Kwang for the construction here, because much like the most brilliant choice at the beginning of the season, which was to have the pilot be everything that it was, including the giant robot and the people, 200 people getting gunned down, and then the surprise move that was so fulfilling to have everyone go home and come back again. Mm -hmm. The finale being budgeted the way it was time-wise, to, to have a confrontation in the rain, dramatic, violent, but ending in a way that we, as you know, people accustomed to being invested in the hero's journey kind of knew how it was going to go one way or another and then leaving so much time on the clock. And we talked about that with the Mayor of Easttown finale too. It's a great, great move in the showrunner's arsenal to tell so much extra story in a way that I thought really benefited the show. I didn't see the twist coming, but I also didn't not see it, if that makes sense. It was the kind of thing that I, and I'm very curious where you were with it to take your temperature on it. When it arrived, I was happy. I was a little bit gleeful. Oh, how fun. I, I like being outsmarted. I didn't feel taken advantage of. I thought that that felt right and interesting and gave us an extra emotional beat that I didn't see coming. It had a little bit of, uh, when I saw it, I was like, this is a little bit like if like all the uh, Stannis Baratheon truthers out there had been right, <laughs> where it was like, we didn't see him die though. You know, like, yeah. but if you go back, you know, a June actually does turn his back on yes, the scene does. and it happens in that room. Uh, and it does take quite a while for the guy to pull a trigger, you know, for the, for the guard to pull a trigger. So it wasn't like shocking. I, I'll tell you what I, my, th my thought process there was, you know, as you, as you mentioned, this is a script that took a, probably a decade to go from page to screen. And I'm sure the uh, writer director would have very much loved for that to have happened earlier, you know, and not have spent this, incredibly long incubation period, but man, did this whole thing feel like something that had been weighted out to a, the milligram, you know, mm -hmm. to the point where it's just like, this is where this climax is going to happen. And then there's going to be this release. And then this is going to come back up and we're going to have this reveal. And then, it, so I just felt like this was one of those things where you, you were like, Oh, this wasn't written during production. This wasn't written on set. This wasn't tagged on, to make it feel different in a way like this was something where the beats of an episode and the beats of a season were mapped out very, very, very precisely. So I thought it was, a, I thought the scene of the old man in, in the bed was really effective. I was like, you know, this, this guy being like the only two, the thing that the very rich and the very poor feel is they don't know joy. I thought was an, you know, really interesting idea to play around with the final bet with the homeless man was really good. Uh, you know, it was it was tidy. It was it was tight. I don't know necessarily, you know, what you do next if this is the sort of the the the, the wizard. I don't know who who comes next as the mm -hmm. as the big bad. I guess it's the front man or whatever. But it was certainly like it was. I th I thought it paid off in a really big way in a way that where I thought like the final physical confrontation in the last game during the actual Squid Game. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, oh, this is like this is like a long fight, you know. Yeah, exactly. And a long fight is only ever just going to be a fight. And I right. think that that's the secret sauce of the show. The, you know, parade pageant of death, of violence, of bloodshed is, you know, it's, it's sorry to say, but it's true. It can be, is, is diverting. It's entertaining. It's surprising. It's jarring. It's unsettling. It is also not what ultimately hits the hardest. And I think that's what's so smart about the way the show is pitched the deaths that occur in the game are heightened. Everything about that is heightened. You know, they, they, they've agreed to be in these absurd circumstances. And as, this, as the games get more and more tense and the players dwindle, we see them, many of them, accept what they are becoming, you know, 
more like horses, not men, almost, as, as, as is said in the finale. What lingers to me is the fact that after all of that, ki mother is dead, mm-hmm. dies alone and abandoned on the floor of her apartment. Sebiok's brother never will see his family again. sang mother will never really know what happened to her son and is sort of given money and an, a, another child in an attempt to sort of reboot and restart. ki daughter is waiting for him in America and is going to be waiting a lot longer. Maybe that's a good thing because she shouldn't see that dye job on his head. But <laughs> the, the, that none of that is fixed and none of that is fixable, you know, is so much more resonant to me. And also why I think this would stand brilliantly and alone as a one-time thing. Sure. I, I don't necessarily think, obviously it's not going to, but it is interesting that Wong had been saying that up until very, very recently, that this was only ever one thing in one season, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure the rollerboard suitcases full of South Korean Wan, you know, is changing his mind, if not other creative ideas that have occurred to him. I think he said something like he's he's excited to tell another story about um, police corruption, <laughs> <laughs> which is definitely what everyone was checking, <laughs> tuning in for. Um, there's definitely going to be more, and that in and of itself is what one of the themes of the show, right? That the trick about capitalism it just gets you to buy in play along with no end in sight i trust him to have something interesting to say about that uh and but but i just think that it's remarkable that the show in and of itself is kind of a triumph with what it actually managed to say in its nine episodes yeah i agree with you so we we could wrap it up there we're going to be back on thursday we'll talk a little bit of uh expectations heading into the next season of succession andy and i will be releasing our watch episodes on sunday nights following the hbo broadcast of succession so you can check for our immediate reactions to the episodes uh on sunday nights at at this very feed thanks to kai mcmullen for producing uh andy i'll see you on thursday are are you going to dress up (laughs) <laughs> for, for Halloween? We can talk about this off air. I'm dressing as Logan Roy, but yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Can't wait. <laughs>